Um, geez, that's bright. Uh, before Aslam gets started, I just wanted to thank our sponsors again. Uh, Google, take a lot, Alan Gray, thanks very much. Without the money, this couldn't really happen, or your tickets would be a lot more expensive, I promise. Um, Offerzen, awesome t-shirts. Oracle, um, we do like you. Uh, Impact Radius and Alan Gray, the coffee, thank you so much. Um, I would be dying right now if I didn't have one. Uh, Smite on here, but I'll tell them when I get back to San Francisco that you like the ice creams. And then, of course, our premium sponsors, Luna and Amazon Web Services. Thank you very much. Um, oh, and thanks, Instagram, for the drinks tonight. It's a pleasure. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, Cool. Thank you for taking the last slot of the day, Aslam, and uh, uh, talk us out. Thanks for offering it, uh, Jonathan. <laughs> so, the, the, the back story to that is that the last time I spoke at this conference was about like edition two or three or something, and Jonathan calls me up like two days before the conference and says, hey, we have some international guests that are speaking and they need to get back to the airport, and could I take the, what he calls the armpit of the conference? <laughs> um, and I said, yeah, let's be good hosts and do that. And so this year I submitted to talk and then I got accepted, which I was thrilled about, and here I am last again. So <laughs> the shitty thing is that you decided to stick around. Um, so a couple of things have been puzzling me. Um, well. This is the third talk I'm doing in, three we in two weeks. And I wrote three different abstracts. And as I've been preparing for them, I keep on coming back to the same thing. Either I'm lazy or it's genuinely connected. So that's one. The second thing is that nobody said Kafka in two days. <laughs> like, what? You can't get it to work. <laughs> like, am I the only one who can't get it to work? It was like, every got it, but got it to work, and like, I, I can't. Anyway, all right. So, uh, uh, yesterday, there was a guy with a bald head and a bit aging uh, who started off, he was drawing graphs in the air. <laughs> he was drawing this, right? Uh, explore, expand, extract, and generate a lot of conversation. It certainly did for me the first time I heard it. Um, but I have empirical evidence that we have a better model than this. And we explored democracy for a while. And you notice a little wobble somewhere towards the end of the inflection, because it happens. Um, and we've been exploring democracy for the last 20 years. We did go into a major expansion phase, which is like delusion at scale. <laughs> and there are certain tech companies uh, that have been making, like Bloomberg, CNN, and a few other rounds that have basically been taking people's money and spending it illegitimately, etc. but have admitted to it. Uh, but anyway, delude us at scale, got there. Um, and then extreme devastation, like just take everything from us and carry on living with it, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, but we just, we, we, we're riding the curve, hey, Kent? We're riding that curve, so just letting you know. Uh, but there's a third, fourth part to it, which is death. <laughs> Uh, which is basically what's happening now to many of those that has caused this whole wave of euphoria in the country and, you know, I should say a manjla, you should say a where to, because, you know, strength of the people and developers are people, so manjla. Good. I tried that in Sweden last week and no one answered. <laughs> I was just looking for family, right, some friendly people. Um, at this point, you can feel this urge to hug the person next to you, go for it. <laughs> hug at scale. But this is not 3x, this is the 4D model. Uh, Subscription-based certification available, and you can inquire for enterprise uh, pricing and licensing. Speak to me after. Uh, and that's because 4D is better than 3x, Kent. Come on. All right, so. <sighs> So if the 3x is not working, you can try this vocabulary at work, right? It, the death part will normally motivate people. So I like this quote. You live and learn, and at any rate, you live. Uh, Douglas Adams. Um, 
I, yeah, there's, there's a certain comfort and despair that goes with the second part that, okay, you could just live, right? Like park on the couch and just get through it, right? Uh, but at most, we, we, we came here to learn, and, and that's what we try to do. Um, and one of the things, which is a shout out to Jonathan and his team for organizing this, is that after a few years of coming back here, I realized that there's so many faces that I've missed. I've genuinely missed speaking to the people. And after seven years, I think you guys have built a community. You've brought people together that have conversations. The content is great, and the conversations in between are even better. And I think with every edition, we meet new people, new acquaintances that I think linger longer than the conference. So thanks, guys. So part of this thing about preparing three talks in two weeks, I was asking myself, what do you do? What do we do? Who writes code? Jonathan did something like, yeah, I write code. OK. Who does continuous delivery? Come on, it's fine. It's OK. No one's going to laugh at you. <laughs> that you're coding in Bash, it's fine. It's OK. <laughs> if fee, it's fine. It's all right. Who gives birth to microservices? It's like this birthing mother person that, yeah, sometimes they still won't. Uh, who places bets on JavaScript type inference on untested code? <laughs> Kent will teach you poker strategies. <laughs> this is a shit idea. <laughs> you will get it wrong. <laughs> so anyway, so this is what I think we do. Um, and I've simplified it. So there's some problem to solve. We have conversations. We have we design something, we write code, the code. We can argue over beers about design and code, and it's the same thing. And I do things the same thing. But five icons with design in the middle creates a nice picture. Uh, so design code, and then somehow it ends up running somewhere. And by run, I mean someone hopefully uses it. Just running it is worthless, right? It needs to get used. Um, and I think of it in these two ways. That early stage, we're figuring it out, is us desperately trying to understand what the hell is going on. And the other part is us trying to apply that understanding. Um, and we sometimes do this. Now, this isn't because of some agile methodology that said you must have this feedback loop and its retrospectives and all sorts of stuff. But genuinely, we've realized that it's a whole lot better if we look at what we did and take what we did and learn and do something a bit better. And so if you don't have that kind of observation that's happening, you're in trouble. And a lot of the talks, we saw people put up graphs of various things that they actually monitor. That's feedback. That's you just trying to figure out what the hell is going on so you can uh, uh, react and adapt appropriately. But largely, that's what we do. At that meta level, that's what we do. But we also do this, right? We fix stuff. You hop onto a box in production and run that query that's supposed to not kill everything. And, or you fix stuff and you push it through a pipeline and it gets, it gets pushed out. But we generally have to fix stuff because we are ordinary people and we make mistakes. And sometimes what we thought was right was actually turned out to be not so right. And we still make off by one errors. Uh, Segwit comes to mind, but never mind. Um, and we fix largely to make this, right? We don't just want to run or don't need to run on a single machine. Uh, you're running on quite a few machines across the network, and you're doing crazy ass things with it. And so this part of this conference is an appreciation for doing things at scale, because that's kind of the problems that we have. And so that's what we want to do. Um, but the issue that I've been thinking about is, what is actually the problem? Well, I'm assuming there's a problem, right? So bear with me. There's different complexities involved. In that early part, it's the complexity of the domain. Uh, that's what dominates it. It's like, what the hell are we trying to build? Okay. That feedback part is complexity of change. You kind of have a very good idea what you want to build, 
But when you learn something, it's not about what you've learned, but how to immerse that, slot it in to what exists. It's that problem of making that first code change once you've gone into production. How am I going to change it? How am I going to slot it in? Um, and that's how do you adapt to the complexity of something that needs to be changed. And that's a different problem. And then, of course, there's this problem, which is about how do you meet the demand? That's that curve that Kent was talking about and his gang sign thing, right? <laughs> so, but that's a reality. There's demand. And to do this kind of scale thing, you need to figure out what's demand and what's the supply that meets that demand. So it's, a, it's actually a non-trivial question. So what do we know about these complexities? Well, firstly, the, the stuff that happens there right at the beginning, it's inherent. You can scream till the cows come home. It's not going away. You just have to deal with it. And you're going to bang your head and your knees and all sorts of body parts against it. But if you don't crack that, you've got no business. Like, you don't understand that domain. It's done. It's game over. Like, just go home and try something else. So it, it's there forever. This one is what I call insidious, because if you don't keep your eye on it, and most of us have our eye on something else, um, and this thing kind of sneaks up on you. And after a while, you realize that, ah, geez, didn't see that coming your way. But it's actually been lingering around as a low priority thread in the background for a while, and suddenly it wakes up and it gets some airtime, and it's like that one requirement or one feature you're going to put in is like, ah, oh, I can't do that. Why? Because of all of those things that happen. I didn't see that happening. And so it's gradual and it's harmful uh, if you don't keep your eye on it, and that's what I call insidious. On this side, it's what I call frenetic. It's wild and uncontrolled. It's like you're just trying to get things to work. Like, just, just make it work. Like, meet, meet, the, meet what the load is. Uh, Superbulous was talking about that the other day. And, and so that's, that's the kind of thing that is. There's an intensity to it. And many of us thrive from that. And that's, and that's great. So in dealing with that, there's different tools. There's tools for learning. There's tools for noticing change. And there's tools for scaling. And so I want to ask myself, what tools do we have? And I think the tools for scaling, I'm going to put a tick against that, because we, we're pretty damn good at that. We may not know it in our own team, but there's an incredible community of people who have solved a lot of these problems or are continuing to solve this. And we learn from it, which is why we sit here to learn from each other. But we kind of dealt with this. Um, and I'm not trivializing it. It's hard. So I postulate that we actually are pretty good at scaling. Um, and scaling varies for each person. I mean, the problems that Facebook needs to scale to is problems that only Facebook deals with. Um, Alan Gray had a different set of problems, and so did Superbalist and everyone else. Um, and so you will have your own set of problems. And you need to scale according and relative to that. But we have a lot of tools out there and gadgets out there and attitudes and ways of thinking and working to make that work. So the tools that we have is all the stuff you hear at ScaleCon from edition one to now. Um, and there'll be more that comes along, uh, including Kafka, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe it's useful. Um, so I, I did a poll uh, and about whether I should go off script. There were 10 people or 12 people responded from this bunch. So it's what I call a teaspoon sample. It's like there's a mountain of data. You take a teaspoon. It's like it's not really relevant, right? Don't give results on teaspoon samples. So I'm not going to go with that. And I decided I won't go off script, but I'll give public health warnings. Uh, and one is that, and it's based on things that I've heard over the last few days and years. Uh, one is microservices increase alcohol intake for me. So. <laughs> If you want to know about how to do microservices in an enterprise, and you're busting your head about it, uh, buy me a single malt whiskey, and I'll tell you. Um, 
But largely, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing, this microservices business, right? It's actually, it, it, it feels like a design issue, and it is a design issue, but it's born out of a runtime issue. And one of the, 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 the guiding principles is that the microservice should manage its own data store, right? And, and we'd love to do that. But largely in the enterprise, how many people from large enterprise here, I'm talking about like banks and banks and insurance companies and stuff like that. You can put your hands up, there's nothing wrong. You'd actually have software that lives longer than most companies. Show of hands. Okay, uh, startups like Series B funding. Okay, oh, so next generation enterprise, okay. Um, and then startups like Garage and just like getting off the ground. What are the rest of you doing here? <laughs> okay, so microservices needs their own, each service needs their own data store. It's hard to pull off, especially if you have long running software in a large enterprise and you want to scale up. The core systems that you have is a giant data store. It just happens to have an API or FTP folder. Um, Okay, secure FTP folder, right? <laughs> okay, all right, secure FTP folder. But the reality is that it's a giant monolith that you can't get rid of just like that, and you can't chop it up. And so that microservices journey, if you're dead serious about it, and the public health warning is that get some really good single malt whiskey and prepare yourself for like a two or three year journey, and I'm not kidding. Like, but stick to it. There'll, there's an upside. That, that curve thing, okay. All right, the next warning. I'm not saying CQRS will kill all your people. It can kill all your people, like Poloni. <laughs> and the recall is a scale issue. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, is that I, I've seen, it, it's, it's making a comeback, the CQRS thing. And rightfully so, because we, we, we now have better technology that, de that deals with how you handle events um, and how you stream data across uh, an organization or an infrastructure. So it is making a comeback. Um, and, and the warning here is that, is a warning from a while back. And that is that don't apply it to, to your entire domain. Find that sub that subdomain that actually would just benefit from it in a remarkable way. And I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the day, a lot of subdomains and domains just benefit from having a single read model and write model. It's the same thing, right? And if it's slightly different, it's still not CQRS and you could get away with it. You can find some really creative ways to deal with this. When it's starting to get a bit apart, the read model and the write model, and there's a little overlap, you're heading into CQRS territory. And I like for those natural contours in a domain that says that this benefits from that if I keep those models differently. The way I read the structure is different from the structure that I use to write. And that's the golden rule. If you genuinely have a different read model and a write model, go for CQRS, and you can do some amazing things. But for stuff before that, CRUD-like stuff, you can, you can, you'll be fine. Calm down, you'll be fine. I've seen many teams that have, create, have chosen this wrong, right? They just chose wrong. And it's creating an enormous amount of accidental complexity that has just resulted in a mess. So two public health warnings. Microservices and CQRS uh, both benefit from alcohol. Demand is not obvious. Uh, you, have, you have a need and you try to supply it. So we could just say infrastructure and load. But what if it's photos? What's, what's the supply side? If it's transactions, what's the supply side? If it's payments, what's the supply side? So we just don't assume that it's CPU cycles or cache or disk space or whatever it is or network bandwidth. It's, it's different. So we've got to figure this thing out. Um, and so I go back to the tools. So in that early part, we were trying to figure out what to do, dealing with that complexity. The tools that we've gotten accustomed to are things like ubiquitous language, patterns, TDD, refactoring, all sorts of stuff that help us fashion some code in some way based on conversations. On the other side, we have continuous delivery and all the tools that we deal with scale. 
right? Uh, but also, again, patterns, TDD, refactoring, and that. So what do you notice around this? What I noticed is that we really have good at working with code. And rightfully so, because if we didn't, we'd be in worse position, right? Management will hate us more. Okay, that, that's what it comes down to. And they'll give us less money. Because if we really suck at code, that's just gonna get worse. But it's thin on the other side, right? And if we don't figure out what we're going to do, what are we writing code for? It reminds me of about two or three weeks ago, this team I was working with, one of the middle manager type people was saying, yeah, but the team needs to write code and blah, blah, blah. And I said, what are you gonna write? They said, log in. And I said, log in to what? Like, just log in. And then, but you've solved login. So that's not the problem we need to solve. So we also need to solve this one because sometimes that problem, we don't really know what it is. We think we know, but ah. You know that day when someone tells you, well, it wasn't what we wanted. And then we'll say, but you said, no, I said it, but I didn't mean that. Well, I, I don't know why you interpret it in that way. And then you go through your emails, and then you take those, all those photographs of whiteboards, and you bring that, and you can't find it because you never indexed it, and all sorts of rubbish. Uh, I mean, that's the tool of choice these days. There's no more enterprise architect. You just take whiteboard pictures, and you store it on your phone, and it's never shared. And Oh, Confluent, sorry. Um, so anyway, tools for code, but what the hell are we doing with the other stuff? And that's what I've been trying to figure out. And I've been thinking about what I do with it. So it's not, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm saying this is what I do. I'm going to pause and dumb down an, an example. And it's a real world thing that I've been working with. Uh, so there's an organization. They offer loans. They're pretty good. Uh, they want to be number one. And they say it takes too long to approve the loan applications. And the workflow is too rigid. And so, as good developers, we'll, we, we, we kind of have this radar that zones into these things like long to approve and rigid. And it's like we want to make it fast and flexible. <laughs> like if you tell a developer this verb, they'll find a verb or a noun to counter that, and that's the solution, right? So, but we hone in on that, and then we'll do things like, let's map out the workflow and figure out where the latencies are and all sorts of stuff. Um, and if you come from some higher order agile coaching team, they'll say you must visualize the value stream, which is the right thing to do. Uh, and you want to figure out what is the slope. And it's nothing to laugh at. Those are actually right questions. It's right things to do for what is on the other side. It's the right thing to do. Because if you don't do that, then how else are you going to break into the problem? But the actual issue is that <laughs> they want to be number one. So the question is that, I mean, here we're dealing with trying to find, figure out the problem here, and they're telling us they want to be number one, and now you have to ask yourself, as a bunch of developers, what do you believe? Do you honestly believe that if you fixed that thing that says too long to approve a loan and the workflow is rigid, if you fix that, it'll make them number one? And that's a hard thing to face. Because that's where you forget the bet on JavaScript type inference. It's like, you put your money on this one. It's like, do we fundamentally believe that if we fix those two things, we'll make them number one? Like, or shift them up the ladder? So this is what I started looking at, is that one of, the, one of the mistakes I've been making is that I, I tend to start with the input when actually I want to model the output. I want to focus on the output, and that's what I do now. I just like think about the output. What is it that we want all the time? What is the intention behind this? And I want real data to help me understand that output. So in a case like this, we look at data, there's a whole bunch of loans that come in that are applied. There's a drop off of those that are approved, that is approved but not yet accepted by the client, and then uh, some get accepted. But there's this double slope. 
And that's reality. That's the truth. It exists. It's indisputable. It's their data. So now you have to ask yourself, what's the output that you want? Because you say you want to be number one. How do you get there? Which slope are you going to effect? Do you want to reduce the, or increase the number of approvals? And there might be a risk associated with that, that, oh, you're approving for someone who may be not able to afford the repayment. Or you want to deal with the fact that people are not accepting what you offer. So they're two very different problems. And so once you figure out what you want to do, then you can ask the question, what do we need to change to achieve that? And the nice thing about working with outputs, it frees you up from thinking about all the variables that make up this problem. Focus the output, figure out what is and what should be, or what you wish, and then find the inputs that actually have a material effect on that. And that's very liberating because you actually separate out the way you think about things. And, and, and you can try that in your own work. It kind of kills that, yeah, but we believe this, and it's speculative, et cetera, which I'll talk about in a bit. But now you're getting a little bit closer to understanding what's in supply and what's, what you need to supply to fulfill that demand, because it's a different thing if you want to scale up how you approve versus how people take up what you offer them. It's different. Okay, still on script, but public health warning. I've seen this far too often. Uh, some really amazing startups I've worked with, and they get to Series B funding, and they accidentally buy bureaucracy. They don't mean to, it just happens. You buy layers and layers, you get the money. Well, firstly, you buy a nice coffee machine. And if you get some really good funding, you hire a barista. Uh, and then you create management in the middle. And that kind of like kills the enthusiasm, right? And it drifts you. The problem with that is that it drifts you away from focusing on the output that you're after. Because that whole bureaucracy thing and trying to get that kind of structure is all input. What's the output you're after? So just be wary of that. Um, I hate of KPIs, but I know they exist, and I don't have an alternative, but I know that it'll kill your growth as an organization. So you've got to figure that out, and if someone figures it out, please come back and tell us about that. But anyway, so right on that one end, we're dealing with how do you model the output. So just focus on modeling the output. If you do nothing else, Every time you're sitting in a conversation, it's like, what, what do we want, right? And model that, and then figure out what you're going to use to get there. And that's, that'll take you a long, long, long way. So you know what you want. Uh, that thing about long, takes long to approve, we need to question that still. It's not ir irrelevant. The question that I ask nowadays is that when someone makes a statement like that, oh, it takes too long and it's too rigid, et cetera, is that, is this, is this an observation? Is it a bias? Are you speculating? Or is it observable truth? Is it fact? Or is it an assumption? And there's often times, and we've been around the block many times in this room, in that you, figure, you, you go through this whole thing, and you might even lay out some code, and then realize that was just an assumption. It's like the assumption kills you. It's like, damn it, it's not that. And then you've got to go backwards and try again. So how can we detect uh, observations and biases and assumptions uh, in conversation? And so you start popping the why stack or asking, so what? And so also use data to confirm those things. So it takes too long, which is a bias. Someone just says it. There's a rigid workflow, which is an assumption. And there's lots of manual processing, which is what we observed. And there's a high rate of exceptions that causes that manual. So a lot of stuff, applications come in, can't deal with it in terms of how to analyze or determine whether we should give that person a loan. And so it's given up as an exception, and someone eyeballs it and decides. And so that's truth from data. You want to find the data. The moment you find the data, you have something legitimate on which to build an argument. 
and then you'll eliminate that speculation, that bias, or assumptions. And sometimes with the data, you can actually make intelligent assumptions. So it's what you believed and what you really want, uh, or what's really, what exists in reality, and that is we approve less than we can. It's not that it takes too long. We just approve less than when we can, and that's truth because of data. And why? Because there's lots of manual uh, intervention, because we just fear giving people loans that they might not pay. So the high degree of impairment. And that's because of high rate of exceptions, and you can ask why, and it's inconsistent loan data. So the one on this side, towards me, uh, is the reality, not the other stuff. The other stuff was just what people were, were, were believing. Right? So once you have what's reality, and it's based on data that supports it, you can now put what the output is, which is what I want. I want to increase approvals, I want automated processing, I want low rate of exceptions, I want consistent loan data. The key word here is hypothesize, because you're still trying to figure this shit out. So you want to hypothesize your future reality tree. That's what we're dealing with. Now, this kind of stuff doesn't take long. Uh, when I spoke about this a few weeks back, someone asked me, how long does it take? So oh, how many months does it take to get to this point? No, it's actually pretty quick. Uh, you can write some very quick scripts and code to actually pull stuff and, and just visualize your data. And sometimes when I say visualize, it's just lists of data in columns and rows, and that's good enough to help you make a decision. Uh, it doesn't have to be with Grafana. It's fine, OK? Just text on the screen is fine. Because you're trying, to, you're trying to find things to help you make a decision. That's what you're after. And then you throw that code away. But the data is there if you want it. You'll find it. And so the long time is incurred in trying to find the data if it's not readily available, but it really is. So these days when I work with organizations and we're trying to figure out and, and understand it, it's like, just give me all your data. And, and they'll say, yeah, you're crazy, you can't take all. It's like, give me all your data. And I know I'll get some. And that's fine. I just want some. And it'll lead me to the next one. It's kind of like what uh, guys are talking about uh, from SensePost about how you move laterally. It's like you laterally move through data. You, you navigate through data until you find the things that are really juicy that actually help you along. So you need to play with data and navigate through it. It's mountains of it. And please, you don't need to build an entire data warehouse for this. Just pull some data, keep it in Redis, or do whatever you want. Put it in Google's big table, big query thing if you need to. All right, so we've got some more tools. Now the issue is that how do we execute on this hypothesis? How do we know we're actually trending in the right direction? So we now figured this shit out. How do we know we're going to get there? So we need to bake something in to help us get there. So the thing is that you have to make that feedback measurable. And we're really, really good at, at measurements. We are incredibly good at measuring things and pulling off things like network bandwidth and CPU utilization and all sorts of stuff like that. So we actually have the mental capacity, intellectual ability, and the tool sets to measure. And we also want to measure what's happening in the organization as a business. So we want to do this. We want to change something in the beginning and see its effect on the output. And then we have to figure out what. So sometimes it's complicated. And so if you have this graph of things that needs to happen in order to do this, like where do you introduce changes and where do we take measurements? And yes, you technically go probe in every spot. But is that useful? Maybe, maybe not. I tried to chunk it up and say, well, there's actually these four general areas. And I want to introduce changes in one place. I like to find just one place to introduce changes. And then from there, we'll see what happens. Trying to put inject changes in a few places starts being a bit more complicated. And I can't balance equations with more than two variables. So that's just it. I mean, after you go to like x squared and stuff, then you go into integration. Ah, let's forget it. Uh, and I want to measure here, here, and here. So now you have an attack plan. And what that looks like is that 
The thing I want to measure is exceptions in each of those points. And so now I can start measuring exceptions. As applications are flowing through, I can find the exceptions at each stage. And I can actually visualize it in a very trivial way. And the next deploy, I, I want to see a material effect. And this is where you can actually start placing bets. I bet you if we change this, it'll drop that and it'll increase that. And the next one, and sometimes you'll lose your bet and it's like, what, didn't see that coming, how did that happen? Now you have something material that you can get to. So what we're actually after here is heuristic-based experiments. It's heuristics. We know we're somewhere in that ballpark. We don't know where it is. It's like trying to find a serial killer, right? It's like we're in the city, don't know. But we happen to see that it happens along this uh, corridor of transport. Oh, and it happens to be around this time. Oh, and something tells me maybe it's within these four blocks. So you just start finding feedback and data that helps you narrow it down. And you don't really know. So you don't bake in hard things. It's heuristics based. So basically, I'm saying don't write if statements, right? It's heuristics. So that's where we ended up. So we've got model the outputs, kill the assumptions, biases, and use data. We've got the code stuff and use heuristics. So this is what I've realized, is that there's data and there's code, and we've kind of lost the art of playing with data. And like, let's make that a first class citizen again. And we're pretty damn good at the code, and we will get better, and we shouldn't give up on that. But let's play with data a lot more, and let's use the data to actually help us figure out what stuff to scale and what's on the supply side and what's on the demand side. And why do I like this? There's an internal consistency to data. There's a truth attached to it. You can't dispute it. It's hard to create consistency with lies. It's like, yes, dear, I'm coming home. Uh, I was working late and actually I was sitting at Moyo having drinks. Oh, yeah, really. Uh, okay, uh, can you tell her later that we were there? Like, great. Uh, and then it's like, but you know, your credit card receipt said that, and it was SMS, and it was, uh, yeah, we just popped by very quickly. It reminds me of this, uh, this, this little thing from uh, Little Britain or something like that, where this, this, this American senator has been in a scandal and he's explaining in front of the press and he says, well, I was really, I, I was driving home and uh, I needed the bathroom so I went to the closest airport and uh, Pablo was there and um, he, 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 he was in the bathroom where I was going to in the same stall, I didn't realize it. He bent over because his contact lens fell. Um, and somehow he backed into me and part of my body went into his body. And yeah, so that's what happened, right? So it's, there's a, there's, it's hard, but when you have the data, you can sit with your team and your people and you can just create a narrative. <laughs> Find the clip, it's somewhere out there. <laughs> it just creates a narrative that's hard to dispute and it makes your life a whole lot easier. And then you can make better decisions, right? And, and the other nice thing about data is that the, the act of making software is so damn intangible. Like we wave our hands in the air and we say we're going to do this, but when you put data down, it's like you can point to the damn thing and say, well, it's about this part, right? I'm going to do that. So next public health warning before I wrap up. Enterprise scale is not about changing tech. Let me explain it like this. Uh, there's a style of design or architecture known as big license up front. Uh, the Agile movement gave us big duff. This is big luff. Big license up front. And there's other things, not just those. I mean, there's that other one that was stealing money from us or paying illegitimately that starts with S, ends with P, with A in the middle. Uh, I didn't say that. I, I, I really didn't. Did I say it loud? Shit. Uh, 
But it's kind, of, it's kind of that whole thing of like build this big infrastructure and your load is sitting here. It's like huge infrastructure, take forever to get it running. And, and because, but now you're doing the same thing, right? You change the tech. So you're going to take, you're going to build this huge infrastructure for a platform as a service with OpenShift. I sometimes stumble and I keep on dropping the F in OpenShift. Uh, <laughs> I got to stop doing that. Uh, it pays off, but let's be honest, right? Let's stick to the truth. The value of this in enterprise is that it increases developer productivity. You get consistency of deployment environments and stuff like that. It's not necessarily about handling the load. So call it like it is. We want to build this infrastructure because it makes us more productive. The most active bank in retail banking in South Africa has something like between 9 and 10 million customers that do something like five transactions a, a month. OK. So we do this because it helps us as developers, right? And that is one of the big upsides. So call it like it is. Don't just change it and, you know. So enterprise scale is genuinely about solving different problems. It really is. You're trying to, you're trying to solve for developer productivity, lots of teams. Uh, a whole bunch of legacy stuff, code that's like 15, 20, 40 years old. It's difficult. So you're trying to scale around that. And so what I've noticed is that when you start measuring things in this way with this heuristics-based thing, you kind of like start, you, you have a lot more ammunition to talk about progress that has meaningful impact as opposed to the number of story points that you didn't do. Okay? Because that's fictitious anyway. And you can calibrate your story points with vegetables or balls or whatever it is, and that's fine. You'll still get your certification. Um, <laughs> but this is a true measure. And if you can get your people to start thinking about the impact of the software like this, it's better. Because now you have a way to actually start talking about releasing smaller things more frequently. And so you want to have that impact. And whether you're a startup in various stages in enterprise, this is a valuable way to think about it. So the software doesn't come to an end. There's no project. It's just this is the shit we do. This is what we build. And that's what we're trying to get to, back to output-based. So now we're thinking in operational systems, not just software. And so what's the holistic view of this? So public health warning, last one, I think. I can't remember what else I've got. So we're talking about Conway's law here. So resist it and you will be slain. I'm serious. So we're actually talking about people, the architecture we design, and the way we communicate. And we're actually getting quite good at scaling. The, the technical aspects of it, we, we're getting damn good at that. right? And there's organizations that lead the way from which we learn. It's kind of like Formula One racing, right? The way they build those cars, some of that ends up in commercial cars, and we benefit from it. So the Facebooks and the Amazons and the Googles and all of those organizations, thank you very much for pushing that envelope. Because some of that trickles through, and we benefit from that. And so we're good at that. But the people in the communication staff, damn it, we suck at that. I even asked you to hug, you didn't want to hug. I, I give up. So two things to wrap up. There's always internal consistency to truth, and it comes from a friend of mine who's a lawyer. And the other thing that I really like is that if the structure does not permit dialogue, the structure must be changed. So whatever you build, if you can't put it up and it doesn't generate a conversation, change it so that you can have a conversation. Whatever you build must generate dialogue. And so you change it until you can generate dialogue. And that means making sure the output is correct, getting rid of assumptions, using data to tell a story. Use data to tell a story. Tell stories with data. And so it brings us to this, that we're constantly working with truth, structure, and dialogue. There's a sense of struggle, which is the things that we're attempting. This sense of history, which is what led us to this point and the data and learning from it. 
And you've got to have a sense of humor, otherwise you're going to turn to be an alcoholic or something like that. Um, so yeah, so thanks for sticking it out. And that's me. Thank you very much. Any questions? Because Moya is around the corner. Yes. What's your favorite single malt? What's my favorite? Single malt um, I'm trying these Japanese things right now. And... <laughs> so, yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, he asked me what's my single malt, right? That's why I said Japanese, not anime, not nothing. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry. There you go. Hi. Um, my only formal tertiary education is as a mechanical engineer, and it just seems to strike me every time we come up with these kind of discussions about, about how we develop software, that the software development community hasn't really learned that much from like, the engineering community. Because one of the most fundamental books that, that we did at university was called The Me Mechanical Design Process. And one of the, the fundamental things there is that you capture the user requirements but then you go and analyze the requirements and you draw up engineering requirements because that specifies how your product is going to work. And then you iterate on the design and measure your engineering requirements against the actual performance. And you iterate on the design until you satisfy your engineering requirements. And just from an agile perspective, I often find that people concentrate on the user story. You know, what does the user want? And I, I, I just wonder if you, if you agree that maybe, maybe software engineering needs to look at some of the the prior art in, in other engineering disciplines in how we approach, approach design and implementation uh, and iterating on design. Okay. So I have a degree in electronic engineering. I learned software along the way. Um, what I liked about the software talking about being agile is that it was sure as hell easier to change stuff in code than with a soldering iron. <laughs> uh, and that little diagram that we drew was the user story. And it got translated badly because we sold it bad and all sorts of stuff. So, but in a more serious note, there, there is an obsession around a user story. And, and the thing is about that is that it's actually a placeholder for a conversation, right? And it's a reminder. And often the title is good enough, okay? If the title carries some meaning. Um, and so you want to have a conversation around that, and you want to question and interrogate that. It's not transferring something that used to be you know, a 45-page Word document onto a little index card in a really small font with a different template and asking people to like, build from the stack of index cards. It's the same thing. So what we're actually after is interrogation thereof. And the, and the unfortunate part of it is that trying to get clarity from ambiguity is really, really hard. So the kind of people that you want to work on this is who are very comfortable working with ambiguity. The, and, and the ones who, who, who struggle have a different purpose and, and, and role to play in the entire team. Uh, but don't obsess, that's my advice, don't obsess about that. We know naming is hard. The engineering have nice names for a long time. A resistor is a resistor and a diode is a diode, right? And so we've got good names out of the box. Uh, but in software and trying to understand a domain, universe of discourse is, is ambiguous. Finding nice names is hard, and we iterate over that. Okay? And you can get certified. <laughs> yes, who else? Her Herman. One, one more. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, awesome. Brilliant talk. Um, what? Stayed awake. I am awake, that's why I'm standing. <laughs> 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 Inside joke. Um, anyway, uh, what advice do you have available for from the bottom up side, thinking hierarchy, in which some of us might be, um, helping to encourage and even create structures that generate dialogue? Sorry, I, uh, I didn't hear that clearly. The advice um, what, on what advice do you have for from the bottom up for you know if you're thinking hierarchy, typ typical enterprise corporate hierarchy to uh, um, help establish structures that, create, that generate dialogue. Uh, I, I think that's probably one okay. of the biggest right. challenges out there. Yeah, okay, so 
advice from the bottom up about uh, creating structures that generate dialogue. Um, come from a school that says that if you draw it, you must be able to build it, otherwise don't draw it, right? And that's been the way I've lived my life as a developer. Um, and so I, I, I draw things very, very often, right? And sometimes I draw with things that we don't want to use, like Excel, right? Putting things in rows and columns in Excel. The moment I, I want to create a tangible artifact and I want to put it back up, and it's often just paraphrasing. It's a replay of what someone said. And so I want to... I want to put that up very, very quickly and help create a vocabulary around that. So to create a dialogue, we must, we must subscribe to a vocabulary. And often we're trying to find those names of things. So it doesn't matter where you are in the organization. It's just that sometimes there's a different lens through which it's seen. Uh, but from the bottom up, I, yeah, I'd encourage conversation and encourage an incredible amount of discipline amongst each other to actually correct each other's conversations, to say, ah, but you meant that. Is that what you're talking about? So I do it in a gentle way. I don't give a glossary to the team and say, you must make sentences from this book of words, uh, but rather just do it in a very gentle way. I don't know if that helps. Anyone else? Are we done? Time? Time. Cool. Thanks right. very much, Aslam.